Marvelous. What, what, out of out of the entire exercise, what would you say was the most challenging aspect? The most challenging aspect was getting in the boardroom. And it still is a challenge, not to say it's solved. Um, IP is often seen as an expert business that kind of lives on its own, um, almost separate from the rest of the company. And very often, because we are experts in the field, we are not so good at communicating with people in other fields. And so, so many times I've seen presentation about IP starting by trying to educate the board about what is a fighting date. I mean, if they were interested, they will be patent attorneys by now. So <laughs> it's, not their, it's not their focus and you have to really try to adjust and be on point and not try to educate it because we have an expert knowledge that we have a mission to educate the world about patents. Um, they, they've been working, you know, many, many boards have been working with looking at the patents from a chart at the end of the year where they say, oh, we have that many files, we have that much spent, everybody claps and we move on. So if patent was critical for their survival, they would have looked into it by now. So I think that was the, the biggest challenge. Um, I also saw, um, I'm sorry, I, I, Richard, I have a question that came in through a private chat. So um, somebody was asking me about the challenge I faced in educating the M&A team about IP data. In my experience, the M&A team was actually um, very eager to get the data. It was more about the IP team getting educated about what the M&A is about. That was the challenge more than the other way around. And, and as I said, it still is a challenge. It still is an ongoing process. But M&A has been working and they've been doing it very well with IP only in the due diligence phase. So it, the education was more for me to learn about their process and see how I could plug in and add value and bring something to them rather than the other way around. So that was the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is company that I have may have missed because they don't file patent application. Um, the existence of the portfolio wasn't a criteria for us to review it. As I said, it allowed us to sort through existing companies, but there are two companies that we rejected because initially they came in and say, oh, we have such strong technology and, and they pitched all their technology. And when we looked, they didn't have any patents. So we turned back to them and asked, and a lot of it was like under development, under development. We are, uh, yeah, it's being developed, it's being developed. And that went back to the fact that we are looking at an operating business. We're not looking at funding a startup. So that actually cut through the smoke of distinguishing. It allowed us to ask that question. It raised the question with the M&A team. It focused your due diligence on those companies on to whether or not they were operational or not. And as it turns out, they were not. So while the existence of IP wasn't what, with the, the absence of registered IP didn't lead to their rejection, it led to asking a hard question, which led to being, them being rejected from the process. Mm. With that, I've answered the question in the chat. I, Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, uh, we've also got a, a, another question on um, uh, how often do you find the patent data uh, ends up being inaccurate or out of date and misleading? So this is about data quality. So overall inaccurate, not so often. Misinterpreted very often. So I would say more than misleading, the, the problem is you do need to have somebody who understands what is a filing date to make sense of those charts. So the, cha the, the, the risk is feeding those charts and it's not shoot and forget. So if you use those charts or if you use something like patent site, uh, you know, indicator, uh, uh, competitive index as a shoot and forget, and, that, and that's a decision-making tool, then I would find this a bit risky. For me, it's a tool to allocate resource, to prioritize resource. And you do need to have an understanding and a critical thinking to not be misled by the information. But inaccurate, I think overall the data from the patent offices is fairly accurate. 
Um, you just have to be able to make sense of it. So, so we've got known knowns and known unknowns and then unknown unknowns. Um, which, which is the most challenging? So you're going to have to repeat that. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I refer to Donald Trump's world then. <laughs> um, they, they, there are many difficult things to identify. There are known unknowns. And uh, obviously, we, we know that there are limitations with this uh, in terms of data quality. But there are also things that we don't know and uh, the unknown unknowns. Um, and, and I was just wondering um, uh, how you get around that. Or, or as you say, do you just use it as a, a, a support tool? an aid to making decisions? I use it only as support tool. And that echoes also, there is a new question that came and it's like, how do we ensure that the target has done freedom to operate checks? Um, basically, if you're waiting to check everything or if you want to have a full view or make sure that there is no risk, you're not gonna do any business. Be if you want to do business, you're gonna have to take some risk and you have to go out there. The advantage um, is, in dealing with operating companies is that if somebody was upset with what they're doing, they would have been sued, most likely. Which again helps, you know, if you're looking at a startup, it's it's a completely new field. You don't know what we, you're getting into. In my example, we're looking at operating companies that have a certain business. So they're making a little bit of wave. They're, they might be very local, they might be very ge geographically limited, but they're they are having a bit of a footprint, which means that if they were annoying somebody, somebody would have sued them. <laughs> so that's how we try to deal with the unknown. Then, of course, when we look at it, we do additional freedom to operate. We do, but this is typically, the unknown is typically something that we have our own process to deal with. And that's something that we integrate in our, in our analysis. That's how we deal with the unknown. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Robin. Alex, there's a question for you. Um, uh, if, if a startup is looking to be acquired, how would you recommend they adjust their filing strategy, uh, the balance between sort of uh, overexposure and cost? I, I think it, it comes back to a case of depends. <laughs> it depends on what, what back to my, it's, it's a bit like the question we had earlier. It just depends on the business and the nature of what they're doing. I think, uh, I think, um, and the technology that they're that they're playing in as well, in my mind. Yep. I mean, I've okay. seen a, I've seen horror stories of companies that have invested in building up huge patent portfolios, and then before they know it, they can't afford to maintain them. They have to let them go, drop them into all sorts of awkward discussions, and then and then you're into another whole discussion, which is not for today, around where those patents end up. But um, but 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 it you know. It's something that I think before you embark on that journey, you need to be really clear about the comment on my slide, actually. Investing in building up an IP position, it's a long term commitment. It's not a short term commitment. You need to recognize that the costs once you start will keep coming as you're building up that portfolio and maintaining them. And that, of course, leaves a footprint uh, behind which uh, other potential competitors can see if, uh, if a company is getting into financial difficulty. Um, so uh, which can be tell to I think also it, it lends back to the point about keeping things secret and confident, confidential. I mean, uh, there's a lot of technology and, and tech being developed in, in new areas where people have got no idea what the final outcome is going to be. So there's a lot of stuff being kept under wraps um, in certain markets in the pharma space particularly where things i would assume are kept very secretive until they know they've got something that's going to fly yep. because and there's cost impact going on that journey it's great and another one for you alex just come in um uh, so what risks might there be when uh, acquiring a startup and uh, what kind of due diligence should they carry out well i i think for me um one of the big risks that i've seen certainly through my holidays of talking to companies is when you look at acquiring a company a lot of the risk tends to be wrapped up in around the assets associated with individuals and people and the movement of people I mean to me that's where I would be thinking the risk are because why what is it that you're buying the company for and why and I can think of a, several examples where we've looked at companies that have gone and bought startups you look at what they've bought why have they bought them it's predominantly because of the people 
or, or the, what the people are creating. So you need to start looking at how well preserved, how well protected they are and how secure those assets are that you're acquiring in my mind. I think it's possibly, to some extent, it's less so about the patentable tech, depending on what you're buying in the stage they're at and where that's at, but it's, there's a lot of stuff that goes on around how secure the people and the, and, and the contracts and, and the chain of command are. That's great. Thank you, Alex. And uh, one more question, given that you were in an IP valuation um, consulting company previously, uh, what's the panel's experience uh, of how companies are reflecting their IP value on its balance sheet? So my response to that is that I think more and more companies are starting to explore that as a, as a way of identifying value. I think um, it's important to recognize that if you're looking to value your IP, it's not necessarily what the final number is it's what are you using it for and what i found is the companies that are using valuation successfully are using valuation as a negotiation tactic or a negotiation tool because when you build a, a model to put the value together there are uh, any number of risks that dictate where the, the valuation is going to fall at the end of the day and depending on how you how you ascribe those risks depends on whether the valuation could go up or down and by what factor so you need to be really careful when you use valuation because in one context it could have one number and in a different context it could have a, a very different value and that's why we speak to those in the valuation world you, you value ip by future income models or cost bases or comparable models it's a whole raft of stuff it's uh, it's but that that's that's my sort of view of the world of valuation and, more uh, it now. Do, does anyone have experience of valuing trade secrets we, we, um, I can talk on, 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 on my side for the experience. The IP on the balance sheet is a cost, unless you're in a licensing company with licensing revenues. But if you're in a licensing company, then obviously it's a revenue. But in a manufacturing company, the IP is a cost and it's nothing else. You try to change points of view by adding information such as you know uh, quality indicators, but if you're strictly speaking of balance sheet it'd be, in a manufacturing company, it'd be a cost. And the trade secret, um, it's an interesting one because it is valued for a representation of certain knowledge. It is paid to inventors as a reward, so it is a cost. But the fact is that I have no knowledge of any company where trade secret would be big enough that it would make it into the balance sheet on its own. So for me, trade secret has always been an anecdotal case, an important one, but still anecdotal. Let's hope Coca-Cola are not listening. Um, so, uh, on the, on another point, uh, Robin, thank you for that. Um, we've got a we've got a couple of questions uh, that come in on your analysis and use of value metrics. So, um, in how easy or difficult was it to explain these uh, metrics to internal stakeholders? It takes a lot of patience and it takes a lot of repetition. Uh, but ultimately, I found that everybody was very interested because it fits, it feels a need um, and it takes a bit of time to communicate around it, but it does feel, it does fit a need and there was a demand for it. Time will tell whether I did a good job in explaining it around. <laughs> well, time, Time always helps, hey? Um, the, the other thing is, uh, if, so if you were um, a startup company uh, and Eaton was looking for a startup in, in this space, um, rather than a small established company, how might uh, they adjust uh, strategy uh, given the potential smaller number of patents that they would hold? So. I think in such cases, when you're looking really at startups or, or very small portfolio, data analytics don't work so well anymore. Data analytics com com includes a certain statistical effect. So if your sample that you're looking at is too small, relative positions don't mean anything and you need to review them one by one. So when we're looking, if you're looking at small companies and I was working 
uh, in my previous company doing that, we were sitting down with engineers for a full day and having them explain it. There was no way around it. It was going back to the IP that is the personal IP, the, what they have in their head, what they're talking about, and, and then researching that because the IP data is good as a statistical tool for me. But once your sample becomes too small, statistics don't mean anything. Excellent. Well, I think that's a good way to end. Uh, we've all got to be careful with the way that we interpret the data and uh, the results are only as good as uh, the data is. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you, Alex. Thank you very much, Robin. Uh, thank you, William, for hosting this. I know you've got a, a couple of uh, uh, interesting things to follow up. Uh, yeah, so um, it's uh, interesting that, that, that Robin brings up the point of, um, you know, effectively interpreting the data that there isn't necessarily a data quality issue, but there, there can be a, a, or a misleading issue. It's an interpretation problem there. So um, something Pattern Site do um, as, a, as a product is the, the services of the consulting team come with that um, to support and then to help interpret the data or analysis that comes with that. Um, we obviously include that in the product, like I say, but um, we also plan a, a, a set of sessions as part of our academy program. This is starting from the September 24th, um, one session per week, obviously virtually in the current climate that we, we have with uh, travel restrictions and such. But um, these will lead through from the beginning of, of why pattern information might be interesting for um, say competitive intelligence or, or other um, business areas to uh, the theory behind pattern analytics to the actual uh, acting out the analysis for particular topics such as M&A that we looked at today or um, licensing, portfolio management and, and such. Um, and those can be booked individually or, or as a whole set. And, and there's, of course, discounts for those multiple sets in there. So that's on a, uh, this innovationanalytics.com. The, the link's in the bottom right of the page there. And um, maybe on the next slide, there's uh, just a few notes of, of some of the other uh, content that's that's available from, from Patent Site in terms of uh, analyses on um, artificial intelligence or, or looking at, at small companies. Um, a posting from, from the weekend uh, in Forbes um, looking at uh, Zooks, the ac recent acquisition by uh, uh, Amazon, which might be interesting for people. So, um, yeah, there's a few bits of information about Patent Site there. Um, and I think um, Alex and, and Robin, it's a, a really nice analysis from, from both of you and, and leading us through to, um, to understand the, the value of uh, IP analytics. Pleasure to, to be with you guys. Wonderful. And thank, thank you for hosting and thank you for attending everyone that's online. Have a good day. Thank you very much.